We want to be blessed by the study of God's Word. So we're going to be back in Philippians. If you'll turn there to Philippians, we're going to be in chapter 3, starting at verse 1. Philippians in the New Testament. Chapter 3. And let's pray. Father, as uh, pages are turning in Bibles, uh, it's wonderful that we can come with the written word of God. And Lord, this is a time where we want to be quiet before you. We want to be still. We want to have our ears open spiritually and our hearts soft before you as we look at these nine verses that we're going to cover. Help us to, to be settled, to turn ringers off our phones. And Lord, we want to be a people that um, we want to have joy in our lives. And this is the whole theme, how we can rejoice in you, have confidence in the cross of Christ. I pray that we would leave this place just more in love with you than when we came in. So teach us now as we study your word. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. So we're halfway through this fairly short epistle, and the Apostle Paul, writing a letter, of course, from prison cell in Rome, he's writing to the church, the Christians there in Philippi. And it was a church that, uh, as many of you know, was established by Paul on a second missionary journey. And you can read about that in Acts chapter 16. And as we have seen thus far in the first two chapters, Paul expresses his thankfulness and joy for the believers in Philippi. They were once that supported the apostle financially, bringing a gift to him. They sent Epaphroditus. If you were with us uh, before Holy Week, when we ended chapter 2, we read about Epaphroditus, and Paul had such uh, wonderful things to say about it, fellow brother and fellow servant of the Lord. It is believed that perhaps he was the one that was the pastor of the church. But as he comes to minister to Paul in Rome, uh, the apostle writing this letter as he's expressing his appreciation, there's great fondness that is here for the church and for Epaphroditus, um, for the believers in Philippi, affection for them. But as we discuss going through chapter 2, as he is learning from Epaphroditus concerning the state of the church, as he comes and he ministers to Paul, even though Paul's in prison, he's chained to a Roman soldier, he was allowed to have guests. And the apostles learning that in the church of Philippi, there's some disputes that are going on. There's division, there's arguing, there's complaining that was taking place in this church that really had a special place in Paul's heart. So in verse 27 of chapter 1 through chapter 2, he addresses that problem. He writes that they should have unity, to be of like-minded, to be of one accord, to have harmony, to stop murmuring and complaining, uh, that you may shine as lights in this dark world. And the way to have unity is through humility. And in chapter 2, he defines humility for us. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. One of the things that will bring division or conflict or rob you of your joy is when anyone or ourselves are being selfish, selfish ambition, when there is pride, when there is conceit. But in loneliness of mind, that's humility. What we are to do is let each esteem others better than himself and looking out not only for your own interests, but for the interests of others. And I just want to remind us here at Calvary Chapel, that is not a suggestion. That is a command of the Lord given to us through his word. To have a loneliness of mind. That we're to esteem others better than ourselves. We are to look out not only for our own interests, but the interests of others. And as we read this, we know that he gives the ultimate example in Jesus that he would humble himself, coming in the form of a man, a bondservant, and being obedient to death, the death on the cross. And he would say to the believers writing here, as he's inspired by the Spirit of God, that let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. Now moving into chapter 3, Paul's going to be addressing another concern, and that was some legalists, Judaizers, as they were called, coming into the church. And if you might recall, as we went through Galatians earlier in the year, that the Judaizers were Jewish believers that would come in behind Paul's ministry. 
And they would say, it's not faith alone in Christ, but you have to be circumcised. You have to keep the law of Moses. And that's what they were saying. They're coming and telling the Gentile believers there that your faith in Jesus Christ, your belief in him is not enough for salvation. Jesus work on the cross. His atonement made for our sins is not sufficient for salvation, but there's more to it. And that is you have to be circumcised to consider yourself righteous or have a righteous standing before God. And in our study of Galatians, if, if you were with us, we saw that Paul would address that very specifically. It's the first epistle that we have of Paul in the New Testament. And he would establish the churches of Galatia in his first missionary journey. And then he would write a letter to them because the Judaizers were coming in, causing confusion. And Paul was very direct as he wrote to the Galatian believers that I marvel that you're turning away from the gospel to another which is not the gospel. Who is bewitched you? You that what has begun in a spirit are you going to try to perfect in the flesh? You know, you're being foolish. Why are you putting your trust in circumcision? Because it won't save you. So Paul establishes them once again in the gospel of grace. After he writes that letter, it is believed that Paul and Silas and Barnabas, there in Antioch and Syria, would go up to Jerusalem because it was a big issue in the early church met with the apostles, you know, Peter and, and with James and the leaders there in Jerusalem, and they discussed this whole issue. What is it that we're going to tell the Gentile believers? We need to bring clarity and understanding to them concerning the gospel. And so they would meet, you can read about that in Acts chapter 15, and they would establish the gospel that was brought to them, and Paul had brought to the Galatian believers, that we're saved by faith alone, Christ alone. It's not by circumcision. The works of the law will not bring righteousness to anyone. So as we see this happening, here it is about 61 AD. It's about 13 years later. And you would think that the issue would be settled, but it wasn't. We know that Paul's still dealing with this and, and having the right to these Gentile believers concerning that. But before we get into that, in chapter 3, verse 1, Finally, my brother, and rejoice in the Lord. For me, to write the same things to you is not tedious, but for you it is safe. So the apostle writes, finally. It's, it's as though as Paul's about ready to sign off, to wrap up what he's saying to them, writing to them. But he has two more chapters here that he addresses them. And this word finally actually has the meaning of continuing to address. I need to continue to address this problem that's going on in the church. I've dealt with the division, the disputes going on. Now finally continuing to address another problem. And that is that there's going to be those coming in that are troubling you. But First, he says, finally, brethren, rejoice in the Lord. And we have already seen Paul's expression of joy in this epistle. He writes about his joy and how we are to have a rejoicing heart. He uses that term joy, rejoicing, some 19 times in these four chapters. Uh, he speaks of it, writes about joy in, in difficult circumstances that he is in. And I hope and I pray for us that we are understanding this. That there is always a reason for the heart of a Christian to rejoice. We cannot always rejoice or be thankful for the circumstances that we find ourselves in, particularly when they are very, very difficult circumstances that come our way. He did not write, listen, rejoice in the circumstances. He writes, rejoice in the Lord. And all of us know that life can be very difficult and it is challenging. And it is hard to live in this world. But you and I as a child of God, we can rejoice in our hearts, a joy in our hearts, a joy unspeakable, because our rejoicing is not in the circumstances. Our rejoicing is in the Lord. Big difference. And who he is and what he has done for us and what he has provided for us. His goodness and faithfulness, his compassion, his mercy. We can rejoice that we have a living hope, that he lives in us, that his word is true for us, his promises, that he'll never leave us or forsake us. I think about what Jesus said to the disciples in that, that upper room the night before he's crucified, that he said as they're confused, they don't know what's going on, and he said, don't be troubled in your hearts. 
You believe in God, believe also in me. So we don't have to be troubled in our hearts, and we are troubled at times because of the things that we end up facing or the things that we go through. But here's the key. We rejoice in the Lord is what we're to do, even as Pastor Luke would have us uh, be reminded of that when we began to worship. And as we rejoice in the Lord, that's what Paul has been expressing, even as he's chained to a Roman guard, is our rejoicing is in him. The Lord knows that when we face rough times and difficult times and problems and loss, they can be very overwhelming, can it? And the Lord reminds us in his word that we can rejoice in him. Because as I said, he is faithful and true. He is our hope, our salvation. And always remember this, that he sees you. Sometimes we think, Lord, do you even see what I'm going through? Do you even care? As Peter writes, we can cast our cares upon him because he cares for us. That his love remains and he promises he'll never leave us or forsake us. And David, 3,000 years ago, he was one that was accustomed to trouble. And you see that in his life. You can see him express that in his psalms that he wrote. There would be this, this cry, a cry of agony, and then a turning to the Lord and trusting him and rejoicing in him. We see that over and over again in the psalms. In Psalm 55, he writes, My heart is severely pained. Terror of death has fallen on me, and horror overwhelmed me. Fearfulness and trembling have come upon me. So I said, Oh, if I had wings of a dove, I would fly away. I'm sure that many of you have felt that way in a circumstance or what you're facing. You ever felt like just flying away? Lord, if I had wings, I'd just fly away. I'd like to just run away. I know that I felt that way. There have been times, you know, I'll, I'll text the kids and I'll say that, you know, I'm going to be gone today. I'm not available. I'm running away. I'm running away to Wyoming and I'm not coming back. And, you know, I always come back. So, um, but you have that feeling that times where you just want to get away from it all. You know, find a big rock to hide under or something. And that's the way David was feeling. But he goes on to write, as for me, I will call upon God and he will save me. And I know that there are some here today, that there are many that have come through the services this morning. That perhaps you find yourself going through a rough time right now. You're facing difficult circumstances, and I can't begin to imagine how hard it is, but I am sorry for the difficulties that you're going through. But I have words of comfort to give to you, and I want you to remember this, that you look to the Lord, because he knows you, he sees you, he's with you. And even as David would write in Psalm 27, I will offer up a sacrifice of joy in his tabernacle. So Paul writes, for me to write the same thing to you is not tedious. Now I'm going to remind you of this. I want to remind you to rejoice in the Lord. And I know that in my life, I have to be reminded of this, that I rejoice in the Lord over and over again. I have to be reminded of that. So I'm established in that truth. Lord, I may not rejoice in the circumstances, but I am told that I'm to rejoice in you. And you always keep in mind that when the Lord repeats himself in the scriptures, it means that, you know, this is important. We need to get this down. Just as parents will repeat things to our children, right? You need to do this. Remember this. You need to keep doing this. We do it so they're established in that. And you and I, that we have a Heavenly Father that says, I want you to be reminded 19 times in these four chapters that you're to rejoice in the Lord. And that's what, what we are to do. So beware of dogs, verse 2, as we continue reading. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the mutilation. So Paul goes from telling us to rejoice in the Lord to beware of dogs. And you would think that this is kind of an abrupt change of subjects. But there is a connection between verses 1 and 2, and it's simply this. That there are those who were coming into the church of Philippi, and, and they were telling the Christians there, again, if you want to be saved, considered righteous, then you have to be circumcised. And the legalists were a problem in the early church. The ones coming out of Judaism. Telling the Gentile believers that you have to keep the law, you have to keep the law of Moses, the covenant of circumcision, which is the cutting away of the flesh, Genesis chapter 17. And what was happening is it was robbing the Christians of their joy. 
There is no joy of someone coming along and saying that the cross of Christ is not sufficient for salvation. That the cross of Christ, Jesus' death, making atonement for our sins, is not enough for forgiveness of sin. But you have to do this religious act. You have to cut yourself. Trying to get the Christians all tied up in religion rather than rejoicing in the relationship and intimacy that we have with the Lord. So the apostle says, beware of the dogs. Now, don't think that Paul's talking about dogs in general. Many of us, we have pets, you know, dogs. He's not saying beware of Fido or, you know, your pet at home. They, they become part of the family. Uh, we have affection for them. But it's interesting, back in this day, the Jews would show contempt for the Gentiles as they would refer sometimes Gentiles as dogs. And I believe that what Paul is doing here is he's given a powerful imagery. Back in ancient times, you know, it was different than it is today. And most dogs would run wild. They would run in packs. They would run, um, you know, in, in, you know, in wild, uh, out on their own, have to feed themselves, you know. And it was very dangerous when you travel. When you traveled on foot, you had to be careful of them. You had to be careful if you had any sheep or any animals with you because those wild dogs were, were a danger to you and to your pets or to your animal, your livestock. So what Paul is saying is, listen, don't let these guys, these legalists, don't let them bite you. Don't let them harm you spiritually, evil workers of the mutilation, of course being a reference to circumcision. Verse 3, we continue reading, For we are the circumcision who worship God in spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. Paul here making reference to the ones who are truly of the circumcision. He says we are. We are of the true circumcision. Not the legalists. Not the ones who are bringing another gospel. Those Judaizers would consider themselves to be the only true circumcised and being right with God. Paul says, no, we are. We are the true circumcision. Notice in verse 3, number 1, those of us who worship God in spirit. It would be Jesus that would say to the Samaritan woman, many of us are familiar with John chapter 4, that the hour is coming and now is when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. So Paul defines true circumcision, one who worships God in spirit, just worshiping and praising God with your hearts. It's not just words that we speak. Even, again, as Pastor Luke, at the beginning, he encourages us, give your hearts to the Lord in worship. We worship him for who he is and what he has done for us. That heart of worship, that adoration that he is worthy of. So those of the true circumcision worship God in spirit and then secondly rejoice in Christ Jesus. Again, that's what we've been talking about. That's what the apostle has been reiterating in this epistle. What he has done for us and provided for us and given us access to the Father and relationship with the Father, forgiveness, salvation. We, we can rejoice in that, rejoice in our Lord Jesus Christ. And then thirdly, the true circumcision is one who has no confidence in the flesh. Now, he's going to expand on this. But those legalists would boast in what they had done in the flesh. Look how we've kept the law. We've been kosher. We've kept the observances. We've been circumcised. Look what I have done. Now, circumcision in Genesis chapter 17, a cutting away the flesh, it was to be an outward mark of an inward belief. It was to be an outward mark of an inward belief in your heart. Jeremiah addressing the nation, God's people, before they went off into captivity. Their hearts were not right with God. They were involved in idol worship and false worship. And Jeremiah, speaking the words of the Lord, the Lord says, Listen, you need to circumcise the foreskin of your hearts. You need to have a heart for me, a devotion for me. So anything that we do for the Lord, listen... Anything that we do, a baptism, we're baptized, uh, we, we serve the Lord, uh, whatever it is, it is to be an outward sign, an outward expression when we worship of an inward belief, right? That I believe in the Lord and I have a love for the Lord. I have a devotion for him. So the apostle here saying something very important. 
Have no confidence in the flesh, that is, trust in your own ability to be righteous before God through your own works. And as we continue, we, we see Paul beginning to expand on this. But before we do, I just want to comment on this. And I think that this is important. If my joy, if your joy was based on our good works, how inconsistent our joy would be. And I'll speak for myself, but perhaps you can relate to this. For me, it would be very inconsistent. One day I'm thinking I'm doing pretty good. I read my Bible. I prayed to the Lord. I had a good attitude. I have served somebody. I'm feeling pretty good spiritually. But the next day, maybe perhaps I didn't do so good. I forgot to read my Bible. I had a rotten attitude, the feeling of being inadequate, the shortcomings that I'm aware of, not what I could be and I'm not what I should be, Lord. I'm just kind of struggling spiritually right now. And if that is the measure of my joy, then I'm going to be up and down spiritually. It's going to be like a roller coaster. If it is based on what I do, if it is based on what I can boast in myself, so he's writing to them to warn them against these legalists. Listen, don't just have confidence in the flesh. Though I also might have confidence in the flesh. If anyone, verse 4 tells us, thinks that he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. So don't get confused and think that Paul's now boasting in what he has done spiritually and being religious. But rather follow the flow of what he is stressing here. Hey, don't have confidence in the flesh. If anyone could have had confidence in the flesh, it is me. I grew up in Judaism, uh, in religiousness. If there is anyone that can boast in their you know, fleshly attempts at spirituality, it, it could have been me more so. And I think that a lot of us, maybe, that, maybe we've thought this, uh, maybe you know somebody who has confidence in the flesh. Oh, they may not boast in being a Pharisee or you know, circumcision. That isn't an issue today. But I'm saved, I'm righteous before God because I was baptized in the church. I was confirmed in the church. I belong to the church. I'm on the membership of the church. I give to the church. I'm a good person. I'm a good parent, a, a good spouse. I do good works. I serve in the church. I read my Bible daily. I pray this amount of time. I fast on these days. Now, don't misunderstand me. As a Christian, we should be baptized. But again, it's an outward act of an inward belief. I identify with Christ as I go under the water. It, it's, it symbolizes that the old man, the old woman is dead. And as I come out of the water, I am raised up in this newness of life. I'm forgiven, this resurrected life that I live in. It's a proclamation that I am saved. A public proclamation that I follow Jesus. Baptism is something that the Lord told us to be baptized. Uh, it's, there's nothing wrong in belonging to a church or having membership in a church. We are to do good works. We are created to do his good pleasures. We are his workmanship creating Christ Jesus for good works, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. I quoted that going through this epistle. I am to serve others, and I'm to do it in love, Galatians tells us. You know me that I encourage you to read your Bible every single day. To be a man or woman of prayer. It's good to fast and seek the Lord. Deny the physical to focus on the spiritual. All these things are a declaration that I am saved. It's a result that I do have devotion to the Lord. And I want to live for Him. And I just walk in His love for Him. And here Paul is saying, you guys that promote legalism, keeping the law and all that to be justified before God... You're less qualified than I am to have confidence. I more so. And he gives his resume here, verse 5. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, concerning the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness, which is in the law, blameless. Paul says, I'll put my record against any of those legalizers that trouble you, that claim to be super spiritual, Paul could have driven circles around any religious person. I had the life of an ultra 
religious Jew. I was circumcised on the eighth day, according to Leviticus chapter 12 and Genesis 17. I was a descendant of Abraham. I'm from the distinguishing tribe of Benjamin that gave Israel their first king, uh, that aligned with Judah. At the time the nation split, the ten northern tribes split into the house of Israel during the reign of Rehoboam. I was a Hebrew of Hebrews. I'm a Pharisee. That's what I was. We know from our gospel studies that the Pharisees were the religious leaders of the nation who were noted for their devotion to keeping the most minute details of the law. Pharisee means separated one. Uh, They separated themselves from all others. We will devote ourselves to being religious and keeping the traditions and the rituals and the ceremonial washings and the Sabbath. And Paul refers back to the time that he had so much zeal for Judaism that he persecuted the early church. Back when he was called Saul before he met the Lord on the road to Damascus. Paul is saying, yes, before I met Jesus Christ, there was a time when I had confidence in the flesh. But that's no longer true. Yes, there was a time when I had great boldness and pride in my own achievement. I was flawless in my external righteousness and religiousness. But I no longer have confidence in the flesh. Because, listen, it's not in what I do. It's in what he did on the cross of Calvary. So if anyone could lay claim to pleasing God by law-keeping and the works of the flesh. Uh, I more so, Paul says. I was more qualified than those Judaizers that are pressing this whole issue of circumcision. And as we go into verse 7, we will see that Paul rejects all confidence in the flesh. But what things were gained to me, these I counted lost for Christ. All these things look good on my spiritual resume. I let go of all of my external religiousness, all of my spirituality, all of my zeal and having a high reputation among the, the, the Jews, among you know, those who were of the religious elite. I no longer have need for religion because I have relationship, relationship with Jesus. And God has poured out his grace and mercy in my life. And I am forgiven And I'm a new creature in Christ. I have a new heart. I've been born again, truly. Even as you remember Jesus told Nicodemus, the master teacher of Israel, Nicodemus, if you want to see the kingdom of God, you must be born again. You must be born again. Having a new heart. You're the master teacher of Israel. You must be born again. I truly worship in spirit and truth. I walk closely with my God. I count all the external religious stuff as lost, completely worthless. All I need is Jesus, and all I want is Jesus. And yet, indeed, verse 8, I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I might gain Christ. So the apostle here, Paul, he's saying, I was so religious. He was so zealous for in, you know, his beliefs. There was a time in his life that he boasted in his religiousness and what he had done in the flesh. And I kind of read between the lines here. I think that perhaps Paul is saying that externally I had it all together. I was polished. I was blameless. I was confident but he truly didn't have a heart for God. I think that when he came to Christ, that it was the very first time that he really knew what it meant to have a love for God. And so he says, I I exchanged the confidence I had in the flesh to gain the excellence of the knowledge of Jesus Christ. I've counted these things as lost for Christ, verse 7. That is all these things mentioned in verses 5 and 6. All the, the religion, all the status, all the pomp, all the, the reputation, all the prominence I had with the nation, the prestige of being of the religious elite. I counted all these things as loss. And in verse 8, I count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Jesus Christ my Lord. All other things I consider it to be rubbish. If you have a King James, it reads dung. 
Now, we live in an agricultural area, so we know what dung is, don't we? It might be translated trash, but dung, trash, it, it stinks. And what Paul says, all this religiousness I count as dung, I give up for the knowledge of Jesus Christ. He's not just talking about a head knowledge. Hey, I, I've, I am a great scholar and theologian, which he was. He wrote much of the New Testament. But this word, to, the knowledge, is, it is gnosis in the Greek. It speaks of knowledge by experience. He is talking about, listen, his personal relationship with the Lord. He's talking about his intimacy he has with the Lord, his closeness to Christ, knowledge by experience. His life truly was centered in Christ. So the question as we begin to end here today is, what about you and me? This is for all of us. I don't want to put my confidence in any achievements or popularity or status. I'm going to count it all as loss. For the privilege and the blessing of knowing Christ personally. And my prayer has been, Lord, as, you know, in this season of my life, I'm looking back at more of my life than what is ahead for me. I don't want to lose that. To know you, to walk with you, to be encouraged by you, to, to just have a love for you, to serve you out of love. Even though it meant trials and tribulations and, and difficulties at times, I would rather have that than to go back to any dead religion that I grew up in. That which cannot save me. There was a time I thought, I'm okay. You know, I was baptized as an infant. I was, you know, confirmed in the church. I had the sacraments, and I, you know, go to church, and I'm okay, and everything. And that's not where my confidence is. It's in him personally. And all that he says, I count it as dung, as trash. Who wants to hang on to that? I hang on to Christ. And be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness, which is from God by faith. Those who gain Christ, those found in Christ, all all the fleshly efforts to gain God's righteousness, I've let it go. I count it as rubbish, dung. But now I know him, worshiping God in the spirit, rejoicing in Christ Jesus, And having no confidence in the flesh. You see, we don't trust in our own righteousness, do we? We trust in him and having faith in what Jesus Christ has done for us. Even as Paul would write in the scriptures that I boast in nothing but Jesus Christ and him crucified. Christ crucified is what we boast in. And what he has done for you and for me. So Father, we thank you for these important reminders and Lord, the things that we do do for you, we are to walk in holiness. We are to serve one another in love. To be men and women of the word and of prayer. But it's an outward sign of an inward belief and devotion to you. Those things in and of itself, we don't put our confidence in. We put our confidence in Christ. Coming as broken people in need, lost to Jesus who died for our sins and rose again. Even as we celebrated that last weekend on Resurrection Weekend, that we believe in a risen Savior. So while we got a few minutes, number one, if you're here, and maybe you have put your confidence in, and being a good person, listen, don't put your confidence in that. Because you can't save yourself. A church can't save you. No works of being good or works that you do are going to save you. We're not saved by works. We're saved by faith alone. So be established in that. You are saved so you can do good works. You are saved to be his workmanship. You are created for his good pleasures. But our confidence is in Christ. I want to pray also for you who might think I fall so short. 
I've lost my joy. I, I, I've been basing it on performance. Base it on Him and your faith in Him. Go to Him. Learn of Him. Yoke yourself to Him. Know that His love remains. You know that he desires that if there's any sin in your life, repent. If there's anything unpleasing, turn to him. Attitudes, whatever it might be, go to your Lord. Confess it. And he's faithful and just to forgive you, to be your help, to yoke yourself to him. So, Father, I pray if there's anyone that just has tried to gain approval through their performance rather than through faith in Christ, they would realize that as we come to you and come in faith in what he has done for us, that, Lord, we can be established in that and we can rest in that. And our confidence is in Christ, in him, so, Lord, I pray that you would fill us with your love. And, Lord, the things that we do is an outward sign of an inward belief. And, Father, I also pray if there's anyone here or watching that you've never given your life to Jesus Christ. That's where salvation comes. It's not by going to church or you trying to be good. You'll never be good enough. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. That's why Jesus came, to die for your sins. And salvation comes as you put your faith and trust in him and coming and confessing you're a sinner in need of the Savior. He rose again. He's alive. Coming to the cross, humbling yourself and asking him to be the Lord of your life. You can do that right now, right where you are. Today is the day of salvation. And you can pray, I come to you, Lord. I ask that you forgive me of my sins. I believe you died on the cross for me. You rose again and you're alive, and I ask that you would be the Lord of my life, my Savior, personally. I want to know you. And I thank you for, for loving me and for dying for my sins, for this new beginning, being born again by the Spirit of God. And I do want to walk with you and know you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name. And for all of us, as we leave this place, again, our confidence in you, Lord. Knowing that you will empower us as we walk in the Spirit to live for you. And may we rejoice in you, whatever it is that we are facing. I want to pray for those who are going through difficulties or challenges or hurt. That they would turn to you and cry out to you and know that you are with them. And we can rejoice in you even in the difficulties because you never will leave us and your promises are true for us. So may we leave here encouraged and built up in every way. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's go ahead and stand.